We're rolling. Welcome to the House Dudes Podcast, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Jack Haas. And I'm Josh Koth. Here at House Dudes, we believe in a couple key principles. Number one, the best way to retain information is by teaching it to others. And number two, a rising tide lifts all boats. We're not competitors, we're a community. So let's get into some real estate investing. Well, we have Kier Weimer on the call here tonight, and I can't thank you enough for being on the show. And I know you're going to have some very unique perspective and, and you specialize in some pretty unique things. Uh, we haven't had really a, a, a lot of guests on the show uh, that specialize in what you do. So first of all, I always throw it to my guest because you always do a much better job than I could to introduce yourself and and kind of give a little background and what you do and what you specialize in. So I don't do any kind of spoilers here. <laughs> sure. So, well, I appreciate that, Jack. And I, um, uh, again, I've been uh, in this real estate world for about six years now. I would consider myself a real estate and lifestyle entrepreneur. Um, I've uh, started in this business as an agent, uh, grew uh, agent practice, and then started a team two years after that in 2015 that, Grew to be the number one team at Sotheby's International Realty um, in about 30 counties and in, in, in all of upstate New York um, in close sales and really built a luxury brand that kind of spoke to the high end. Um, from that, um, the success and, and some of the income that was generated from that uh, allowed me to branch into other areas and other capacities in the real estate industry. I think a lot of your listeners probably know there's so many different ways to build a career, to build income and to build wealth through real estate. Uh, for me, I wanted to not just look at it through a transactional lens as an agent, uh, but find ways to also build things as a principal, uh, an investor, and a, and a developer. So that led to some other things um, in uh, hospitality development, starting a hospitality portfolio. Um, actually, it's a funny story. I was a listing agent for a hotel that I ended up purchasing a resort with two partners, completely renovating it and um, reopening it about three years ago. Um, and then it led to other things in investment. I'm currently the uh, senior vice president of a uh, development fund uh, out of New York City, Manhattan, called Odessa Realty Investments. Uh, we invest in multifamily apartment complexes around the country, uh, mm-hmm. mainly um, 250 units and above, so large assets. Um, and uh, we purchased uh, about just over $250 million uh, in real estate over the last four years. And, um, you know, over a couple thousand apartment units. So that's been a, a great platform to really um, grow um, based, you know, based on the experience that I have, um, you know, be uh, kind of introduced to other opportunities in the industry. And then that's led to a multimedia company too, which we just started last year, which is probably my most, um, I would say the thing I'm most excited about now, which is now taking the things I've learned in luxury brokerage, hospitality development and investment and really creating content, thought leadership materials in the way of digital course that we have called Sophisticated Agents, um, you know, doing some things with books and a podcast next year to mm-hmm. take what I've learned and really try to help other people now uh, do the same thing, build income, wealth, and freedom into their life through this wonderful business that we know as real estate. Sure. You know, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that I haven't run into many people who have had such a focus on the luxury side of things, whether it's you, you even talked about having a resort and, and other things. What, what made you decide to focus on that niche and how did you get into it? Yeah, good question. Um, I think how I got into it, it's a two part answer. One is by my proximity to it, meaning this resort in particular was very close, like um, not even a mile, half a mile from, a um, summer vacation home that my family's owned for 50 years. My grandfather bought it in 1962. So I knew of this place. I grew up going to it. And then I ended up becoming the listing agent for it when the sellers wanted to sell. Um, And we couldn't sell it on the market for two years. A lot of deferred maintenance. You know, owners just, it it just was, it was, you know, kind of foundry. It was just not doing well. It was, it it needed a new vision. It needed new capital and new direction. And, Mm -hmm. We saw an opportunity. Two of my friends from Manhattan called me up one day and said, hey, we're at State of the Rat Race. We want something new. We want to move to the mountains in upstate New York. And what do you have for options? What businesses are available? So we started to brainstorm. 
back a napkin, turned into a vision idea. We got more excited about it. We, you know, kind of um, crushed it out a little bit and turned into a business plan. And next thing you know, we put together an offer. We worked out a deal that was really favorable uh, for both parties and we bought this place. Now, the funny thing is though, sometimes you, you know, in life and in business, you learn by doing and putting yourself, uh, yourself around people and resources that can help you. Now, we took a big risk with this. We had a vision. We knew we wanted to create. We knew that there was a market for it Mm -hmm. that we could meet. And there was a product market fit. However, we had no hospitality experience. It was three kids, you know, 30 years old, no restaurant experience, no development experience. And we bought this, you know, several million dollar property and put over seven figures into it. And here's the beauty of this. When you have a solid vision, when you are smart about who you put yourself around, when you reach out for help and you're resourceful, and when you build something where there's a demand and a need, some great things can happen. And I'm proud to say three years later, we just won number one best hotel and best resort for luxury hospitality and runner up for both of our restaurants in the entire six million acre region of the Adirondack Park of upstate New York out of like, I don't know, over 300 properties. Mm-hmm. These are three, three kids who really had no idea what we were doing. So the moral of that story is, don't be afraid of taking a calculated risk of going after your dreams and of trying something new um, because some great things can come of it. And we're really you know, glad that we did this because now we've got this great place and this project and we're doing other ones now and replicating that model of building a luxury resort that spoke to a segment of the market. Um, and meanwhile, we've been a great place. We can bring friends and family and we've added 30 new jobs to the area. And, you know, it's just been a really good project. Yeah. Well, that, that, you know, that spurs, uh, and I, I warned you that we're probably going to chat a little bit about mindset because you, you yeah. said a couple things that really s- s- spark something there. Now, regarding the proximity of the place that you, you eventually acquired, I, I always find it really sure. interesting that uh, people are so focused or they're so convinced that it's not going to happen or they can't buy anything profitable in their backyard. Yes, yeah. that's one of those things that I think is always interesting. But the second thing is surrounding yourself with um, with the right team and the right minds to lift each other up. How how has do you mostly invest lo- in your backyard? Is that kind of where you're you're going to stay, and that's what you're comfortable in? With great question. Um, I think when you're starting out in your career, or you're entering a new market, right, or new property type. Right. as an investor developer, really in, in anything, I think it is wise and it helps you mitigate risk to start where you know, right? Start in a market in an area where you can, you, you really understand, right? The movements, the demographics, the, the things that make that market move, what works, what doesn't. You really understand the competitive landscape, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's really important. Not absolutely necessary, but important. And it helps hedge and mitigate risk. Now, once you develop a model and you have some success and you understand the operations, the turnaround plan or positioning strategy, et cetera, I think you can start to replicate that outside of that home market or region like we're doing now in other places and looking at other opportunities. And depending on the asset class, right, if it's hospitality versus apartments versus industrial or, 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 or retail, I think it really is, is going to be a little bit, bit um, kind of a case-by-case basis, meaning sometimes you have to chase market and yield in other places that you're not familiar with, right? And you have to get educated on those markets Mm -hmm. and you have to partner then with people who are local experts so that you can bridge that divide of the expertise um, and experience deficit, right? That you might have by just jumping into a market in Nashville or Florida or Southern California where you don't have the local knowledge and expertise. Yeah. Well, no, I've always found too that this is the case too, because you don't know what you don't know. And unless you bring in some people that, have some expertise and knowledge and who can fill in those gaps, you'd be, you'll, you're usually surprised at what you'll learn. I mean, uh, things yeah. that haven't even crossed your mind. So talk a little bit about, you know, those partnerships and everything that you've created and the importance of, because I, I, so, I, I suspect just based on our discussion so far and what I've read about you, you probably take as much care selecting the individuals you surround yourself with as you do the properties you eventually purchase. Yeah. So that's a great point. And I think it's something that not every 
investor or business person really looks at the same way, which is I think when you're going into business with somebody else, it's almost as if not more important to be comfortable and to have a great working and ideally somewhat of a personal relationship with a business partner as it is to understand the merits and the strengths and the value of a certain deal, right? Or mm -hmm. property. Because you can't really execute a successful business plan, right? Without having a strong partnership with identified roles. Everybody knows what they're bringing to the table, right? And you have a commonality in purpose, values, and vision. Because if you don't have that, you don't create a solid foundation, right? Mm -hmm. From the outset, what tends to happen is dissension, right? Arguments or differences in, in opinion down the road, which can lead to fissures and breaks in the partnership, which then affects the business plan and the strategy execution, which then affects the returns, which then affects everything down the line, right? So, you know, and, and it can ultimately lead to a, a breakup of a partnership and or, you know, legal uh, remedies. So I think that that is absolutely correct. I think having a good understanding of what you seek in a partner, almost like what you seek in a property, right? Or an investment. So I mm -hmm. think it's actually important. Something I've done in a cursory way, maybe I'll do it more scientifically now that you bring it up. It's a good idea is create a one pager in terms of like, what is important to you and what are the important values that you want to have a partner possess, right? right? And make sure that there's alignment with your own personal and professional values and goals with those of a partner. And you can do this in a very transparent way and have that conversation even, not as like an interview, but as a bilateral conversation to make sure that you have some alignment. It's not going to be 100%. It's not going to be perfect. But, you know, you probably want 70 or 80% to line up on the important, you know, points uh, to you, for you to know that you've got a pretty solid partnership and bond from the outset. Sure. So, you know, this leads into a, another topic that I, I noticed that I've seen this said on your uh, pages a couple times, but living the break-free lifestyle. Yep. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What do you mean by that? Sure. So I like to um, kind of espouse and, and really lead this idea, this concept that we're building out to as a body of knowledge and a way of life, which is the break-free lifestyle or the live-free lifestyle. And it's really something that stems from, you know, a very – personal story and a very personal event um, that was a, a, a huge tragedy in my past um, that I'm happy to share a little bit about because it, it's actually formed the foundation of who I am. You know, sure. it's, it's, it's really informed my constitution as a person. Um, it's helped define how I live today. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really formed my, my new vision for my life and what I can do to serve others, humanity and the world and actually leave a legacy of, of, of purpose and contribution. So when I was 23, my senior year in college at Syracuse University, I uh, got into a, a tragic boat accident that I was responsible for. Um, it was alcohol related um, with several of my friends on a lake um, up in the Adirondacks where this resort is actually where I grew up. Um, and a friend of mine passed away. And it was about the worst possible scene and situation you could ever imagine, um, Jack. And it's one that stays with me um, in many ways today and, and each and every day. As a result of that, I was actually sentenced to serve time um, in New York State Prison. And I served much of my 20s um, away in prison, just under four years, um, as a result of my behavior and conduct that evening. Um, I was released back into society when I was 29. Um, I was living at home with no, you know, no job, on parole, curfew, no license, no money, no prospects not knowing what I'm going to do with my life and how I'm going to start to live a new life and a better life and one of purpose and, and contribution. And, you know, it was, it was very challenging. I had to break through a lot of different walls, um, not just when I was away to learn how to move and live and survive in this foreign atmosphere without any kind of freedom. But then when I got out too, I now had to reintegrate into society in a way that I was not accustomed to when I was constantly faced with people telling me no telling me no that I can't go back to school. I got denied from seven different graduate schools that I applied to when I was out that first year. Not one business school or law school let me in. And I made my turnaround and what had happened in the accident, the central part of my application. 
I then realized that summer was sitting there reading my last letter of rejection from school. And I was wondering, what am I going to do now? What I literally can't go back to school. Nobody will give me a chance. I can't repurpose my life. How am I going to get a job? I have to check this box off on every application. What am I going to do? And I said, you know what? In that moment, I had another epiphany as I faced this big wall that I had to work through again. Mm -hmm. And it was this, you know, I had to be an entrepreneur in every sense. I had to break free from my limiting thoughts, from my past, and from the scarlet letter, right? And the stigma that was placed on me, rightfully so, for what I had done. But I now had to prove to the world and to myself that through my actions, I was worthy of another chance. Mm -hmm. I was worthy of starting a new path, right? Living a new life. And then I wasn't just that kid known for that horrible accident. So when I got really honest, I took responsibility for what happened. I decided to repurpose my life. And I got really, really honest about what led me there. Mm -hmm. This month, I'm actually celebrating 12 years clean and sober, which I'm really, really grateful for and excited about because it's formed the foundation of all of this. Mm -hmm. You know, the world started to open up at that moment. And I said in that moment, I'm going to start to live intentionally. I'm going to live freely. And I'm going to break free from all these limiting thoughts. And I'm going to go after it and create a life of my dreams, one of purpose and impact and contribution. And that was the beginning of this just crazy six, seven years now that's happened. I'm now getting to this point where I never thought imaginable. Um, and again, it, 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 was, it was all due to a mindset shift. It was mm -hmm. all due to a system I created for living, a philosophy of life. And it was one that I think holds value for so many people, no matter what background you come from, no matter where you are, you don't have to be in, in, in this dark place that I was to, to still be suffering from your own figurative prison, right? So many mm -hmm. people are limited by their beliefs, by their mindset, their background, what they grew up in, what people tell them they can and cannot do. And I want to help people realize that none of that stuff matters. It matters what you believe you can do. It matters mm -hmm. in charting and setting out a vision, a massive vision for your life, committing relentlessly to it, being flexible on the methods and persevering until you achieve your goals because we're capable of amazing things far and away above what we even think we are if we give ourselves permission, right? Mm -hmm. And we all allow ourselves to go after that because again, coming from my background on what happened, I never think I'd be where I am today and I'm 36 just turned and I feel like we're just getting started. Yeah. I, when you first told me that story, I, I it, it, it's, it really hits hard. I mean, I, I, it just opens up a ton of questions. I mean, when you're when you're coming out of prison and you're being and you're and you're being turned down at all these colleges and 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 everything, like what what kind of things or activities? Or what books did you read? What what did you do? Yeah. Like how did you? I mean, the reason I ask is because I I find that even myself to stay in the proper mindset, I'm constantly having to consume podcasts and audiobooks and and anything yeah. to maintain it it's like it's like a big balloon if i don't keep blowing blowing up there's a hole in the other end and and if i'm not maintaining yeah. some level it's just going to deflate like what what about you how do, how does that work and how did you achieve that mindset that you need to to fight through all this great question jack and i think i so I think I have an innate um, drive. I always have, even before this happened. I've always been ambitious and energetic and inspired to try to achieve greatness, to try to create something in this world that was really, really meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I've always known that I would do that. I just didn't know the how, right, or the path. And I certainly didn't predict or anticipate what happened and the zigzag path to get to where things are now. What I would say is, a couple things led to this in terms of the, um, the mindset and the ability to, to think differently. And one is I was always a student of the world. I was always remaining and, and, and being coachable and teachable. And I learned that and attributed a lot of that to my father, who was a 40 year um, academic um, head of library system at Syracuse and academia. My mother as well, uh, both very well educated, very intelligent people who instilled in my brother and I to never stop learning, right? To mm -hmm. always be a student of not just your craft, but of the world and other crafts, things that you might not even have interest in or know you have interest in, right? Right. Um, and so for me, that was big because when I was away, I had a lot of time on my hands. So mm -hmm. what I did was 
I read a lot of books. I read the entire Western world canon, the great books of the Western world, like 250 of the best works in history, literature, philosophy, um, you know, science, English, all of these different uh, areas. And what that did was a lot of which I had read, you know, growing up in, in um, school and in college, but most of them I hadn't. And it really helped set the foundation, I think, for lifelong learning. Mm-hmm. And then I got introduced to the power of the things that you and I know to be so valuable, which is the self-help space, personal and professional development material. I hadn't touched any of that until I got out. And then 2011, when I was re- released, 2011, 2012, I started to get acquainted with it. You know, I started to learn and follow a little bit about what Tony Robbins was doing. He was a huge idol and mentor for me that I've coached with and gone to several of his events. And then from there, as you know, you start to, to see the other people in the industry that are making mm-hmm. waves, that are adding value, that are helping transform lives. And then I started to go to events. And then I started to discover podcasts. Um, and I, I now had an iPhone where when I went away, I had a razor. Remember the flip phone? Yeah, yeah. So Did I you get see out it. Motorola just announced they're re-releasing yeah. a new razor. I saw that. Yeah. It was so funny. So much changes in three and a half years. But I came out, I was like, what is a smartphone? And and now I got this phone and it's like a computer in my pocket and it's like $800 versus the Razor. It's like 200 So right. times change really quickly. But anyway, I got accustomed and I got acquainted with the power of this kind of material that was so accessible in my pocket through podcasts, books on Kindle. I just started ordering and investing and spending time and money on advancing my capacity to dream, right? Mm-hmm. And then being around the tools, the specific training and tools to get me to where I wanted to go. So real estate for me was always a means to an end. It was my path to freedom, freedom in every sense. If I had to define one value that's most important and paramount in my life, it is freedom because mm-hmm. I didn't have it for so long and I wanted to do any and everything to not only regain it, but to preserve it and expand it. So real estate for me was a vehicle to expand my freedom, my freedom of schedule, my financial freedom, wealth freedom, right? Freedom in thought, freedom in different, you know, things and pursuits. And it's allowed me to become a multi-dimensional entrepreneur in real estate and and lifestyle um, areas by building these different income streams and these different things that can contribute to that, right? Because as you and I know, financial freedom creates a world of opportunity, right? It allows us to get in more of our creative zone. It allows us to um, just create more things that we might not be able to without that level of financial freedom. It allows us to open up new doors and circles of people that we can meet and to travel and and enrich ourselves more. So for me, that was really, really big. Yeah. I I wrote down one phrase that like really struck a struck something there. I really liked that the way you said it, advancing capacity to dream. That, that is something that, uh, that's 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 really interesting the way you you worded that. So when you are advancing your capacity to dream, um, what I have definitely have found is a lot of especially newer investors, um, they they get the they get in the proper mindset, but now and the, and they're advancing their capacity to dream. Yep. But they're still in the state of analysis paralysis how do you how do you like okay you you have the dreams you you know the direction you want to go yeah but how do you how do you get out of that dream state and get into the action state great question um i think a couple of tips i'd say there that i'd recommend um one is when you not just build the capacity to dream right and think outside of your let's say area of expertise comfort level or market for a specific Mm -hmm. uh, as an investor um you have to do things that we as a a quantitative analytical mind would need to do which is mitigate areas of risk right to do that it helps make it easier to say yes and to take the action so to do that we need to become educated right in the Mm -hmm. thing that we're thinking about doing so we have to be resourceful and rely on ourselves. Nobody else is going to do that for us, right? Two, we want to find good partners, local knowledgeable people that can add value to the team in the process, mm-hmm. right? Three, we want to replicate ideally a model we've already been successful with in another area. Right. So that can be, you know, um, taking your model for the hotel reposition we did and taking it elsewhere, right? 
um, could be you've got a great reposition strategy, strategy and a value add apartment complex. Well, that could be successful in other markets too. You just need to learn the other markets and the competitive landscape, the competing properties, and what the tenants are really demanding and paying for right in that market. So mm -hmm. um, I think you know lowering the barriers to entry, mitigating the risk points, um, and then educating yourself and being accountable, right? And realizing that nobody's going to do it for you. You got to do the work. Um, can really help. I think mobilize and elicit action so that you can break through that wall of just dreaming and thinking to actually execute. Sure. So, okay. It, it's really been a long time since we've had somebody like yourself on that, that can talk, that's talking the mindset and, and the importance of it. You brought up the Tony Robbins thing. Like, I, that's always been something that I haven't uh, delved into my, myself. You know, I, you, the, the well, wait, Awaken the Giant Within book is, yeah. is always on the radar, but I haven't read it yet. But after chatting with you, it's something I probably should put on the top of the list there. I would highly recommend it as well as um, Money Master the Game and his recent book, Unshakable, was really good too. Um, Tony's just... I think uh, a larger than life figure that has been one of the industry's founders in terms of self-help. He's been doing this for 35 years. Um, you know, he's a, among some of the best and he's really transformed millions of lives. You know, when you look at the, the, the effect he has on people in person at one of these events, he fills stadiums with like 20,000 people in it and they're doing stuff that they just would never do. You got people breaking down, you know, getting into their, their inner traumas, addressing some of their pain and, and suffering points because his whole mission is to end suffering in the world. He wants everybody to live in their own unique greatness, right? Realize their potential and not be suffering from whatever suffering is for you because it's, you know, for um, any one person, right? It's going to be different, but his mission is to just help people live better. And I love that. And he's got a larger than life personality and is very magnanimous and, and gregarious and he in person is is pretty awesome to watch his level of energy as a probably a 55 year old now is unbelievable his events will go from eight in the morning until sometimes 12 or one at night i yeah. mean it's just great and he's on the stage most of it hmm. um at least the power within a great event went to it in right outside of new york and then i went to business mastery in las vegas but at least the power within we did the famous coal walk right you're walking across you know right. ember coals and this thing, I was like, okay, I'm totally burning my feet. This is going to kill. I'm going to have blisters. It's going to ruin my feet, but I'm, I'm obviously going to do it. But the training leading up to it, it's insane because they're shoveling on literally hot embers that are like this big, you know, that are smoking. And you're like, how am I going to do this? All of the mindset training, mind over matter, and all the intentionality that they do prior leading up to it. I literally walked, didn't run, walked over like, I don't know, 20 yards of burning embers and I literally didn't feel anything and my mm. feet were not ruined and calloused afterwards. It was crazy. I still don't even have an explanation for it. Huh? That's interesting. It's really cool stuff. <laughs> so, well, I, I could keep talking about this all night, so we better, I want to switch back a little bit to the real estate stuff because, um, sure. uh, talking about your resorts and, and a few other things, I was wondering if you are experiencing any of that distru dis disruptive disruptive uh, trends that are going on right now with Airbnb and a few other things like, or do you even, do you see other trends on, on the horizon? Yeah. Um, so we're not really feeling the pressures of the home rental model and the Airbnb and VRBO much because it is a different traveler and we offer a unique experience in terms of these luxury rooms with amazing views right on the water, access to the lake and access to two on-site award-winning restaurants as well as other amenities. So, you know, you don't get that with Airbnb, but you know, we're also not going to be winning out on the uh, travelers that are like big families that, that, you know, want to rent a five or six bedroom house. We're just not, we're not really ever going to win that one over. And then we're okay with that um, because in our market, we don't have, a huge amount of them. Now, nationally, it is a huge trend. Um, and a lot of municipalities, as, as we see in jurisdictions, have banned it or have severely regulated it, um, basically due to the hotel lobby and the fact that they aren't as regulated. They're not paying the bed taxes, the hotel taxes, the occupancy. There become, you know, parking issues and, you know, utility and water issues and usage issues and, and all these other things that I think are adequate issues to talk about. 
But I think more importantly, what it's doing is it's making hoteliers and developers and owners of hospitality properties think differently about how they market, position, and evolve for this next chapter. Because now you've got this whole new Uber of hotel rooms that is only getting bigger. I mean, they've got millions of rooms that they're renting on a daily basis on Airbnb across the world. And what does that do? It changes supply levels, changes inventory, it changes pricing and ADR, average daily rates. And you, you have to acknowledge this growing trend, right? And travelers too, not all travelers, certainly not most business travelers, but families and millennials are liking the idea of living more in a home environment when they're on vacation. So mm -hmm. I think it, it's, it's definitely a trend and it's definitely a threat. Um, but I think there's ways that you can compete and position yourself against it and they have to be based in amenities and experience. Mm, sure. So, you know, let's talk about, are you, you're still a realtor today, right? Or a broker? I am, yeah. I'm an associate broker in New York State and I'm uh, president and founder of my team, the Cure Weimer team at Angle and Bulkers. Proud to say we actually just moved our team about a month ago over from Sotheby's International Realty. Jack, so we're now at um, actually one of the uh, largest, fastest growing international luxury brokerages. Uh, we also have divisions now that we can offer clients in private aviation brokerage, yacht brokerage, international travel, development, marketing, um, and investment in commercial real estate, whereas I didn't have that option before with Sotheby's. So it actually fits in really nicely. It's kind of a full mm -hmm. suite offering for our clientele across the world. Um, and we're really excited. It's a great company and brand. And yeah, I lead a team. Like I said, we've, uh, that's really what got my start in the industry. Um, it's a passion of mine. We continue to grow it, but I'm also doing other things now um, in, in the industry. So that's always a curiosity too. How did the branding change go? It has, have you seen any change there? Was it for the good, for the better? Did you see a dip? Uh, how did the branding yeah. go? So we're currently right in the middle of that. We actually have not rolled out our public launch and announcement that's happening in about a week. So right now we've been limping into it. We had our first million dollar sale in the first week with our mm -hmm. new company, which I was super excited about, a waterfront place up in the Adirondacks. Um, that was a really good cash deal pretty quickly. But yeah, it's a lot of work, I gotta tell you. It, agents yeah. that are looking to switch, it is a lot of work. It's disruption, it's costly. Um, there's gonna be downtime as we move you know, clients and business and, and, and build back up. But the thing is, it's all about culture. And mm -hmm. where we were, it wasn't right for us anymore for a number of different reasons. So where we are is where we are going. So the future of real estate is here. We're super excited about it, about our alignment, about the culture, about the shared values and the vision for the future. And it, it's just going to be a small dip in transition and then it's going to be poop right back up. Yeah. No, that's, it's, it's always cool to see the, the changes and, you know, uh, it, it, uh, you always start to question too. Like, you know, I, I know I pointed out that we, we used to be called the REI rookies podcast and we went to house dudes podcast and, yeah. uh, you know, the, I'm, I know a podcast changes is a fraction of what you're experiencing, but you know, it's, it's surprising what you, uh, what you have to think about. There's all of these little, Oh. little tentacles of your brand everywhere and anywhere and you have to change change it everywhere and anywhere just to make sure it nothing gets lost totally and we're still missing stuff i'm getting messages hey this old company was on this about section or was on the footer here and i'm like oh man so it, it takes a while and there's just a lot of cost and, and time involved with any kind of transition especially when you're a known entity associated with a brand for a long time in the marketplace so, um, you know, I, I, we're probably coming up on our time here together, but uh, I always end typically with uh, a couple questions. One of them is, is, sure. uh, there been, is there a question you wish I would have asked you tonight? Wow, that's a great question. Maybe what I would leave with your audience, um, and I'm happy to answer that one if you'd like to ask it to me, but I'd, I'd like to serve your audience and the listeners in any way I can and be mm -hmm. a resource. Um, so in any way you think that'd be appropriate, I, I'd love to help. Yeah, that's awesome. And I probably have a couple ideas for you after, after we get off the call here. Um, and then if uh, you have any like favorite recommended books, resources uh, that you would tell, like especially new and newer investors, like what should they check out? We already talked about Tony Robbins, but 
Was there anything else? Yes, yes that's who that's a good one. Um, there's some classics in the mindset space. Um, well, foundational historical read, you probably know Napoleon Hill, Thinking Grow oh, yeah. Rich, one of my favorites, um, just on how to think properly and how to go after your, your dreams and the law and the, the power of attraction. Um, what else were foundational for me? That was a really big one. Tony Tony's books. Um, boy, there's so many. I can't even, I, I literally read, so right now I'm reading two books a month. I try to read about 24 sure. books a year. And I listen to, I don't know, three to five podcasts a week and a couple of audio books because to your point, Jack, it's important to just be around positive, uplifting thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And moods because what it does is our mind is a sponge and our subconscious and psyche is very much absor uh, uh, absorbed in as well. So we need to be putting that stuff into our body and into our mind and soul because the thing is our outputs are directly proportionate to our inputs. Mm -hmm. So we need to be really conscious and mindful. So I try to do that on a daily basis as part of my morning and evening evening routine. Um, so I would just leave it with that. Read books that are intentional, that are inspirational, and that can help you tactically with your goals. Um, you know, and, and also believe in yourself and set out a vision for your mm -hmm. life and write it out and get clear and make it a narrative and take time on this and do an inventory and see where there's a deficit, what skills, knowledge, and people do you have to bring into your life and your sphere in order for you to get there, right, and accomplish mm -hmm. your goals? Because there's always going to be a bridge, right, between where we are and where we want to be. Meaning, whatever level of success you achieve, it's not time to just kick back. That's time to reset now that you have a higher floor and start to create a new level and a new vision and a new set of goals. Right. You know, I've, I've, I've said this a few other times and, and, and I probably stole it from someplace, but uh, I've always described it as when you're thinking about it and you're dreaming it, it's a goal. As soon as you put it on paper, it becomes a target. And, yes. uh, and uh, that it's such an important activity and an action that people have a tendency of not doing. Um, and I, I wish more people would. I love that. That's so true. And it, it just helps by putting it out into the world. It gets out of your head, like you said. Put it somewhere where you can see it, you revisit it, um, and maybe find an accountability partner for it, you know, or declare it on social media. It just There's something about putting it out there that, that helps you and then subconsciously starts to attract the resources and the things into your life that you're going to need to accomplish it anyway. I don't know. Yeah. It's just a weird law of the universe. Well, you know, that's one of the reasons why we started this podcast is that uh, it was as much to hold us accountable because if you're yeah. preaching this, you better be doing it. <laughs> yeah, I so love it. that's one of the reasons that this, this originated from and it, it's yeah, I love that. been turned into a great situation. So uh, where do people find you? How do they get a hold of you? Um, what's the, what's the next step there? Sure. So um, you guys, uh, anybody on listening on the audience can learn more about me just at my website, which is kierweimer.com. It's spelled K-E-I-R-W-E-I-M-E-R.com. Um, there, there's everything from my background to um, some of the different uh, programs we run with digital courses to events and uh, masterminds we're doing. And uh, I want to mention too, um, we're uh, actually publishing my second book in January. It's called Live Inspired, um, and it's five-minute intentions to energize your life and career. Uh, we're going to be donating portions to a couple of charities that are important to me. And the whole goal there was to help other people live an inspired life and to do so very intentionally. So, And I'll make sure to include all of those links in the show notes. Uh, but I can't thank you enough. This was a great conversation, and, and I hope we can do it again. Yeah, I really appreciate you and your audience, and thank you for the time too. And, uh, yeah, everybody have a great day. We've put a lot of effort into providing useful content, and if you've found value in the show and have any interest in supporting us with a small donation, head over to patreon.com slash housedudes. And if you have any thoughts or questions, shoot us an email at info at housedudes.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at housedudes. And if you like what you're hearing, head over to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It really helps other investors out there find the show. And remember... Massive positive impact requires massive positive action. We'll see you next time. This episode is brought to you by housedudes.com. 
Do you have time to actively manage flipping and rentals yourself? If so, go for it. If you live in a market that won't cash flow or don't have the time to do all the work, are you just out of luck? If there was a way to participate more passively, would that appeal to you? I'm sure you have questions about how the process works and what to do next. If that's the case, fill out the form on housedudes.com slash investors, and we'll reach out to see if you are a good fit for our business. This is First Come, First Serve, and we will have to stop taking applications when our goals are met. See you at housedudes.com slash investors. a man what to do with his money, but if you ain't investing in property, then you're dumber than a dummy. I'm not dumb. I'm smart. Well, buy property. That's my advice.